many, many years ago, back in the 80s, we did an fem eco-feminist conference here at Hampshire. And it was a wonderful oh, God, environment to be in and to uh, be in a place that has a tradition of looking at education in creative and alternative ways. I'm happy to be here today. Um, come to talk about earth justice and earth healing. And um, I come at a time when really we are at a crisis, at a crossroads in terms of the future of the earth. So um, among many other things I've been doing lately has been working on fiction and working on screenwriting as we uh, work to make a movie out of my novel, The Fifth Sacred Thing. So, Hello. Uh, I'd like you to uh, actually don't close your eyes and go into trance. We don't want to go that deeply into this, but I'd like to just paint for you the scenario of the disaster movie of the future that we are walking into. Mm. It's a hundred years from now. Uh, the trip that I took to get here from Boston down to Connecticut and back up here uh, would be very different then because most of Boston is underwater mm -hmm. and most of the outlying areas are filled with many, many ghost forests of dead and dying trees that are poisoned by the underground leaps of the fracking wells that were done a century ago. Uh, they are filled with the starving survivors barely eking a living out on uh, trying to find something desperate to survive on. And in a world where uh, all those things we think about and civilization has basically collapsed. That's the scenario we are setting up for ourselves and for our children. Um, and there's a Native American proverb that says something like, if we don't change our direction, we're going to wind up where we're headed. Mm. <laughs> um, I think that is the future that most of us in some deep level have started to feel is inevitable. Um, Again, as I said, working in the realm of fiction and movies and popular culture, if you look at what popular culture shows us about the future, how many movies can you think of that show any kind of a positive, hopeful future here on Earth? Anyone got one? Just a bit stupid thing. <laughs> <laughs> why we decided at this point to try yeah, exactly. to make it into a movie and help it reach more people. Um, but aside from that, there are a few other ecotopian novels. There are things like Woman on the Edge of Time or Ecotopia and a few others. Um, but most of what we see about the future, uh, even something like Avatar, which paints this beautiful vision of the future where at least big, giant, blue people live in connection to nature. Um, but has the premise that we've destroyed our planet. And if we can't imagine a different future, how are we going to create it? So I'm starting with the assumption that I don't have to persuade you that things are bad. <laughs> right. Am I right about that? Yes. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend a lot of time persuading you how bad they are. Um, because it's not what I want to spend this time doing, not because it's not important to face those facts. Um, we are also at a crisis in terms of social justice and economic justice. And again, I'm assuming that I don't have to convince you that things are bad on that front either. I will say this, I've been looking at some of the graphics on the internet and uh, there's a wonderful little animation floating around. I think you could Google something like um, income inequality and find it that actually graphs 
what people think the difference in income is and what the difference in income actually is. Mm -hmm. What the difference in income and net worth is in this country is absolutely staggering. Mm -hmm. Something like the top 1% own something more than 40% of the wealth in the country. And something like the bottom 50% uh, own something more like 2.5% of the net worth in this country. So we are essentially living in the kind of inequality we used to associate with undeveloped third world countries, you know, with vast amounts of poverty stricken peasants and a few rich people at the top. We just haven't quite figured that out yet, though we certainly are starting to do that. And that's one of the reasons for the Occupy movement of the last year or so, um, it's striking spectacular rise is uh, this just basic sense of outrage that people have come to feel uh, about, wait a minute, the deck is so deeply stacked against us that um, we need to do something, even if it's just we sit ourselves down in the public square until things change to make a difference about that. So things are bad. We agree on that. Yes. <laughs> but what do we do to make them good? Uh, that's, to me, where the concept of earth justice and earth healing come in. And for me, justice and healing are concepts that go together. Um, I come to this sort of myself out of a couple of different roots. One is in earth-based spirituality, the old goddess religions and traditions and their cousins of indigenous traditions around the world uh, that have a different spiritual view of the world than many of the more, quote, mainstream traditions uh, in that we don't see God, divinity, deity, the sacred as something outside of the world, we see it as embodied, as imminent in the world. And we see this world itself as the terrain of our spiritual development and our spiritual journey. Coming from that perspective, um, if you believe that the earth is sacred, and sacred being not Again, something you bow down to and worship, but sacred in the sense of what is sacred to us is what's most important, what we most deeply care about, what most truly sustains us, and you know what we care about enough that we're willing to take a stand for. It. We're willing to um, put it above our personal profit or convenience or comfort. If we believe the earth is sacred and nature is sacred, then, uh, and if we believe that the terrain of these questions is right here on earth, uh, then we have to engage with these big questions of our time. We can't just sit by and let idiots destroy the earth. And if we believe that each human being is an embodiment of the same, uh, that each one of us is the goddess in some form, um, then we can't just sit back and watch some people oppress other people. We have to be involved in trying to create a world of justice and a world that allows each individual the maximum possibility to express that being and express their creativity and express that essence of who they are. So um, that's one of my sort of roots into this question. Another one of my roots is as an activist, I've been involved in um, political actions and organizing really since uh, I was in high school during the Vietnam War in the 60s and many, many, many other issues and um, movements since. Um, and as somebody who believes that the spiritual and the political run together. And again, just as we have that spiritual call to be an activist, as an activist uh, is 
one of the ways in which we experience our spiritual growth and our spiritual development. You know, I have um, spent years teaching people ritual and magic and leading trances and leading inner journeys and doing wonderful, beautiful, creative ceremonies and rituals. And many, many times I've led people on a journey to go down and face your deepest fear and confront it and wrestle with it and overcome it and empower yourself to move beyond it. But the most powerful experience I've ever had along those lines came uh, when I went to the West Bank as part of a group called the International Solidarity Movement uh, to help support the Palestinian nonviolent movement against the occupation and for justice. And we got a call when we were still training in Jerusalem that um, the Israeli military had invaded the Balata refugee camp uh, just outside of Nablus and that they wanted witnesses to come and be there and be in presence. They had rounded up all the men and arrested them and um, they needed people to be there. This was in 2002, so it was shortly after September 11th. It was just after the beginning of the Second Intifada and there were a lot of places that were being invaded and were under martial law. So we went there, we got a little um, van that we were able to get a driver to take us. All the checkpoints were closed, so he took us up into the mountains, which you could still do at that time, and let us off. <coughs> and we had to hike down through the mountains into Nablus and hike down through the town to Balata. And I became aware as we were walking down, uh, first of all, that I was terrified. <laughs> And uh, <coughs> I didn't want to show it. <laughs> and secondly, that this was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. We were walking down through this town, this really this small city, and everything was closed. Everything was shuttered. There wasn't a face out on the street. Uh, but we were walking down, 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 and it started to feel more and more like those trances I had led people on where we, we were walking down, 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 you know, deeper and deeper. And as we got down, 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 deeper and deeper, people started to peek out of their windows and wave at us. Um, someone came out and handed us sunflower seeds, <laughs> you know, and scurried back in. And I also became aware that what I was afraid of, what my terror was, was not the tanks, was not the military, was not any of those things. What I was really afraid of was the Palestinians. Because I was Jewish, I was raised Jewish, I was raised in you know, the love Israel family, and uh, to me, you know, I suddenly became aware on some deep level, even though I was there to be in solidarity with the movement, that deep inside, I like, oh my God, I am walking into the heartland of the enemy. And that I was indeed walking down, down, down to face the thing that was my deepest fear. And we got down to the refugee camp, started to walk in, and a uh, tank started to shoot at us. <coughs> and so we decided, that wasn't the way to go in. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, managed to get a ride over to the other side of the refugee camp. There was a tank there, but we were able to just walk right in and it didn't shoot us. And suddenly there we were in the middle of a Palestinian refugee camp. And the one thought in my mind was, this is exactly where my mother never wanted me to be. <laughs> How did I get here? And it was starting to get dark, and when it gets dark, it's really dangerous because our premise was that the Israelis didn't really want to shoot internationals. That got tested and wasn't all, didn't always prove to be true, but uh, most of the time it was true. And, but the problem was after dark, they couldn't really see who you were, and they couldn't really tell you were international. So we knew we had to get 
undercover, and our contact was way on the other side of the refugee camp. And we called her and said, what do we do? And she said, go into any house. They'll take you in. And I was going, like, go into any house <laughs> in a Palestinian refugee camp? You know, I, I wouldn't go into any house in a middle-class neighborhood in San Francisco and <laughs> they take me in, you know. Um, but at that moment, a door opened and someone called down to us and took us in. And sure enough, that proved to be true. Within a few minutes, we were all housed in different people's houses, and people were glad to have us there. And we were eating dinner, and we were being fed by people who uh, I realized were not actually my enemy. <laughs> and on that trip, um, I remember I became friends with the family. When I had my little pocket tarot cards, uh, which I always carry because you never know when you're going to need an emergency to row me. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been using them to the uh, great amusement and, you know, sometimes, especially the French people on our trip, French, you know, tend to be very rational. Like, what is this? <laughs> You're not going to make our decisions with these <laughs> 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 go into the refugee camp or do we find someone else for the night? I pull that car and sit the star and I'm like, let's go. We go. There's a beautiful star right over that tank that didn't shoot at us. You know, by the end of the trip, the French people were calling me up on the phone and saying, oh, we are here. We have to decide. We go <laughs> But I had, uh, my friends had asked me to read their cards, you know, and family and I thought, oh, I don't know if this is like, is this Muslim kosher to read cards? Maybe it's haram, maybe it's forbidden, but I did. And as soon as I brought out the card, and I have found this to be universally true almost everywhere. And you look at it and go, oh, we know these. Yeah. <laughs> Will you read for us? You know? <coughs> so I've been reading tarot cards all night, trying to read tarot cards for people who didn't speak English when I didn't speak Arabic. Um, and trying to make uh, positive interpretations of the cards, um, whatever they came out to say. And at the end, uh, they put me to bed in their bed, and they went and slept on pads, and all the little children in the house came and slept in the bed with me. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, lying awake there, having the most powerful experiential experience of my life, going like, I have walked in to the heart of what I felt was the enemy. And what I found is people have given me this incredible level of trust. You know, that they have taken me in, they fed me, they put me to sleep, and the children are right here in bed with me. Um, something broke open at that point that shifted in a way that was deeper than any kind of trans journey I've ever done. And it made me aware that all of those people that we look at, that we are afraid are our enemies, um, that within each of those people is this hope of connection, uh, is this possibility of trust and alliance. And that has never left me since that day. So again, when you see the spiritual as embodied in the living world, then the living world becomes a terrain of your spiritual journey, and it can be a tremendously powerful and empowering place to experience that kind of growth and that kind of change. Um, the third route that I bring is something that I got involved in in the 90s when I met a person, a friend of mine, who had taken a permaculture design course. And she started to talk to me about permaculture. Mm -hmm. And I started to go, hmm, now we're always saying the earth is sacred. And we're always singing these songs about earth healing. But this is how you actually do it, you know. This isn't just chanting about healing the earth. This is like how you take a piece of toxic ground and restore it to health and restore it to life. And this is tremendously exciting. So. I uh, eventually was able to take a permaculture design course and got involved in 
learning it and practice, practicing it and teaching it. And permaculture lends some of the insights that I want to bring today when we look at this question of what do we need to do in order to heal and transform. If we look at what climate change is calling us to do, it's just a few simple changes of small things, like our energy systems, our economic system, <laughs> our transportation system, <laughs> our food growing systems, uh, <coughs> our basic way of life. <laughs> and uh, that, I suppose, can be a little bit daunting. On the other hand, uh, it's also a great opportunity. Um, the Chinese character for crisis uh, combines the symbols for danger and opportunity. Uh, it is an opportunity because really those, most of those systems are not functioning and need to be transformed. So this is a good reason uh, and perhaps a good strong impetus for doing it. Um, but underneath that, all of those transformations, and what links them all, first of all, has to come a shift in our consciousness, and a shift in our awareness, a shift in our way of viewing the world and our understanding of the world, away from seeing the world as basically a realm of dead stuff full of separate, isolated objects that we can <coughs> use and exploit and toward seeing and understanding the world as a web of relationships that we are intricately involved in. That view of the world, that relational view of the world, is the core of the shift also away from the sort of abstract sky god spiritual traditions toward the earth-based spiritual traditions, away from that transcendence of God being outside the world back to that sense of the sacred being imminent. And it is also a shift that science even has been going through. You know, it's not even 21st century science, it's actually 20th century science. You know, back in the 1920s, they were just, you know, trying to Einstein, relativity, and trying to split the atom and take that tiniest piece of stuff and go deeper and deeper and deeper into it until you got down to the very, very, very smallest piece of stuff there was. And what they discovered was when they got down there, there was no stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there were particles, which might be waves, which might be particles, which might now be strings of probability um, that you weren't really there at all. You know, you, you, you tried to put your finger on them and pin them down, your very perception of them changed them. And that level of understanding of physics and relationship is slowly working its way from esoteric science out, but has not yet in our popular culture supplanted that mechanistic model of the world mm. uh, that basically sees the world as a giant clock with gears that tick and that work in a very linear way. Um, as we make that shift, our science and our understanding gets more and more sophisticated. So that relational shift of understanding systems and patterns underlies computer science and underlies things like the internet, which has made possible certain <coughs> kinds of relationships and connections across the world in ways that were never possible before. Uh, and underlies shifts in other disciplines, like in psychology, from just individual psychology to things like family systems theory and thinking. And <coughs> it underlies shifts in science um, from a botany and a biology that's just about classifying and categorizing to sciences like ecology that look at the relationships of things within ecosystems and how things impact and affect each other. Um, we also need to make that shift as a shift in culture uh, because when we do make that shift, then it opens up for us a possibility 
that we can actually find a way to live in this world uh, that will not destroy the environment we depend on, but instead actually be able to heal and regenerate the environment. <coughs> And that shift, that understanding of interconnectedness and interrelatedness, to me, is the core ethic, the core understanding of the goddess religion. So there's a chair here and a chair there. So, oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> and it is um, really the core understanding that underlies permaculture, which is a system of ecological design that looks at how we can take nature as our model and by doing so, learn to work in the way that nature works, uh, how we can meet our human needs while actually healing and regenerating the environment around us. So permaculture, as a system uh, began in the 1970s with two Australians, um, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. Uh, Bill Mollison was a professor at the University of Tasmania, and he and David were running around the Tasmanian rainforest as a giant eucalyptus old growth forest. Uh, doing ecological surveys and looking at animals and plants and biology. And they started to ask this question. They started to say, how come nobody has to go out here and manage this rainforest? <laughs> nobody has to prune it, nobody has to fertilize it, nobody has to spray the bugs, and yet it is one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. How can this be? And if nature can do this in the rainforest, what would it be like if we, instead of plowing the earth up and planting these monocrops and doing this industrial agriculture to feed ourselves, could we have a different kind of agriculture, a permanent agriculture, that would model itself on a rainforest that would be self-sustaining and self-productive? <coughs> and they gathered information uh, from cultures all over the world, they drew a lot on indigenous knowledge and indigenous practices, and began to come up with a set of ethics and a set of principles that you can apply to different kinds of systems um, to start doing that work of redesigning them into something that can be ecologically sane, sustainable, and productive. Um, so the ethics in permaculture are basically identical to the ethics in earth-based spirituality. Uh, they care for the earth, care for the people, and those two ethics, I think, are important to understand that they very much go together. Um, sometimes you'll meet environmentalists that kind of have the idea that human beings are like a blight on the planet and and would be better off without us. Any of you ever have those thoughts? <laughs> you know, you can definitely make that case, right? Um, but I actually don't believe it's true. Um, I actually believe that the planet, Gaia, uh, went to a lot of trouble to evolve us into our current form with the big brains and the opposable thumbs. And <laughs> that she's actually rooting for us to like figure out how to use the equipment. <laughs> Especially the brains. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, it's an impossible philosophy to organize people around. You cannot mobilize people around the idea that the world is better off without them. <laughs>
and that is, in fact, what I believe. <coughs> and what gives me hope when I look at the crisis that we do face. Uh, as dire as it is, there are huge forces of healing and regeneration in nature, in the world, and in body, in human beings, and human creativity. And that when we can mobilize them, we can actually sometimes turn things around more quickly, more effectively. Uh, and in more wonderful and surprising ways than we can imagine. So care for the earth, care for the people. The other thing is, you know, if you've ever met those social change activists who somehow believe that we can take care of the people uh, separate from the environment that actually sustains our life. You know, mm -hmm. We need to have jobs, even if those jobs are in nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. Pipelines or in fracking, and that's more important than these, you know, sort of unimportant environmental concerns. Again, I think that if we are using those big brains, if we are understanding ourselves as part of an interconnected web of relationships, then we have to understand that we cannot take care of the people. Uh, in isolation from the environment that sustains us and supports us. And that if we destroy the environment that sustains life, it doesn't <coughs> matter how many jobs we have, it doesn't matter how many profits we make, we are going to simply be dead in the water, and that's not a good thing. Um, care for the earth and care for the people <coughs> have to go together. Also, in caring for the earth, we have to care for the people who are part of that earth. And many, many people and many environmentalists and many do-gooders have gone into the community and said things like, oh, well, here's the indigenous people here in this beautiful, pristine area with all this endangered wildlife. We better move them out so we can protect the wildlife. <laughs> and what they find is that that never works. Um, Try to move the people out, and oftentimes what they do is move back in in resistance or poach the wildlife uh, or work against you. Um, working with the people understands that there's a long standing relationship between those indigenous cultures and the wildlife and how they function in an area. And that if you work with those relationships, then you can engage those people to become protectors of the wildlife protectors of the land, and you are going to make life better for people and for uh, the land and for the wildlife. So, um, earth care, people care, and the third ethic, I like the way they frame it in Africa, which is care for the future. Mm. Um, mm. Other people frame it as fair share, rhymes nicely with earth care and people care, or with return the surplus. It's the idea that, again, we are working for systems that extend into the future. So when we have abundance, which we create, which we do create when we work with nature, then that abundance goes back into the system and helps to sustain it, helps to enrich its diversity, uh, its productivity, uh, its sustainability. And that abundance does not become extracted, taken away, it or go into some other system or go to feed some great holy abstraction, which uh, in our culture has now shifted from being the holy abstraction of God to being the holy abstraction of profit uh, and the balance sheet. So that third principle to me is the social justice principle, um, the principle in indigenous cultures of giving back. You take something, you return something. Uh, it's the principle in organic gardening. You grow food and you are extracting fertility from the land. You return what's left, you return the waste. You close the loops and return that cycle to the land. And when you do that, then you continue to build fertility, you continue to build abundance, and you find that you can extract uh, enough energy, enough richness to create human abundance. Uh, without depleting and destroying the resources that you're dependent on. 
So, um, to me, when the, the question of what do we do to bring up healing is first we start with that shift in consciousness and we start by being clear about what our ethical principles are. Because if we don't have that understanding of relationship and we don't have a set of ethics to guide us, we often come up with solutions that are just as bad or really stupid. <laughs> like the idea that somehow or other fracking is giving us clean energy that is going to give us energy independence or that nuclear power somehow is the answer to climate change. Um, those ideas are wrong and stupid. <laughs> Bill Mollison actually defines evil as stupidity rigorously applied. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, um, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time and energy explaining exactly why they're wrong and stupid, but I will leave time for questions, so if anyone has any questions, you can ask me then. Because I want to get on to what we actually do in the practical application of healing. Uh, and again, permaculture also has a set of principles that are kind of guiding principles we apply when we start to look at um, how we work to heal and regenerate the earth. So one of them is that principle of closing loops finding out where there is something in a system we might call waste and finding a way to turn that into a resource. Mm. Um, <coughs> you know, that might be a waste stream. For example, in San Francisco, we're now taking the waste stream of used grease from restaurants and turning it into resource, turning it into biodiesel, which runs all of our buses in the summer. We do that, then suddenly our buses are not running on fossil fuels. Um, Biodiesel is relatively clean burning fuel. It's basically vegetable oil with a little bit of methanol and lye. Um, we're also not running it on so-called clean natural gas, um, mm. which might be clean in its offputs, but is it anything but clean in how we get it and how we extract it. Um, and that's just one of many, many thousands of examples. We, you know, there's a waste stream in every city of tons and tons and tons of cardboard that goes out um, in the city every day of the year. And we've been able to extract some of that waste stream and use it to build gardens and sheep mulch, build soil and build compost. Um, many, many ways when you start to look at it. You know, if you're looking for a career, you're looking for a business in a way that's going to help the earth, go find something that seems like a waste and figure out how to make it into a resource. Um, at the same time, there's a field we're starting to play in here we call social culture, mm. which is the idea of how do these ideas apply to our human systems and our social systems. And I think in our human systems, we have many people that we consider waste people youth, gang members, prisoners, um, <coughs> all those people that our society relegates to the very, very bottom level and who are seen by uh, the extractors as a resource. You know, we see uh, more and more push in our society for every area of life to become privatized and become a profit so that prisoners can become a source of profit for some mm. private corporation mm -hmm. and use them as cheap or basically slave labor. But that's not the kind of resource we want to see. Uh, what we want to see is things like programs. I work with a number of programs in San Francisco in the inner city um, that take young people who are at risk of incarceration or becoming gang members and um, put them to work growing food in the inter inner city in an area that's a food desert that doesn't have a lot of access to good, clean, organic food uh, so that they can learn skills, so that they can make a little bit of money 
so that they can learn the kinds of skills they need to go out and eventually get a job, and so that they can hopefully eat some of that food. I can't really talk any louder. I'm still got uh, the residue of the flu, but there is a chair down here if you want to come sit close to it. Permaculture is the principle of diversity. The idea that diversity is a resource is in the natural system, diversity means resilience. Uh, you have a natural meadow that has 400 different kinds of plants growing in every square yard. You get a disease or you get a bug uh, in that meadow and it might munch around on one plant, but it's going to have a lot of difficulty finding the next plant that it's going to enjoy and then it's going to be able to take it out. You replace that with a field of genetically engineered corn that's genetically identical, that's Roundup ready, where everything else living has been sprayed away, where all the soil biology has been killed off by fertilizer and pesticides. You get a disease or a bug in that and it takes out the entire crop. The potato famine in Ireland caused such huge devastation in the 1800s um, was so devastating for a number of different reasons. One was because they were basically planting one variety of potato that was susceptible to the blight. If they had had biodiversity, multiple different kinds of potatoes, they might not have lost the entire potato crop. You know, the other reasons it was devastating in economic were economic. You know, it was devastating to the poor who depended on potatoes to live. It wasn't devastating to the rich who had multiple sources of food and, men, and who controlled access to many of those multiple sources of food. So while people were dying of famine, Ireland was actually exporting grain. <coughs> and that is often typical of famine and shortages. That they're not biological shortages. They are shortages of compassion and shortages of justice. Um, but you know, the principle is that when we design systems, we design them to be diverse. We plant polycultures rather than monocultures because that gives us more resilience. And that, again, is also a social justice principle. That if we are looking at a group or we are looking at the more diversity we have, if we are all people who come from the same class background, the same racial background, the same ethnicity, uh, you know, the same gender, we're going to look at the world in roughly the same way. And we're going to be missing out on big parts of reality. If we expand that, if we can bring in more diversity and people with different backgrounds, different genders and different life experiences, that is going to increase our intelligence. It's going to increase our understanding. If we can value that diversity, instead of looking at people as a problem uh, because they're different or a threat, we can understand them as um, a gift, you know, that that other perspective is a gift. It's an opportunity for us to expand and enrich our understanding of the world. And let's look at those principle of edge, uh, or ecotone in biology, where two different systems meet, uh, and that creates a third system that often is more diverse and more rich. You know, where the ocean meets the shore, it's one of the most biologically rich zones because there's so many different niches that life can fill in so many different ways. Or if you want to know where you, you know, how to increase the richness of your deer population, you aren't going to wipe out all the trees and just have meadows, or wipe out all the meadows and just have deep forests. What you want is edge, those places where the forest means the meadow. Because then the deer, what they like to do is go into the forest for cover and then go out to the meadows and graze. So that principle of edge, I think, also is one that applies.
applies very much to our social institutions, um, where two different cultures meet. Sometimes it's a place of dynamism. There's a lot of forces at work there. So if you know two different cultures are meeting, that can be a place of tension. It can be a place of conflict. But it can also be this tremendous place of creativity, of diversity, of new ideas that are generated. Um, going back to the 60s, you know, it was that meeting of Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy. That edge generated all these different ways of looking at the world, understanding the world, uh, new philosophies, new theologies. Um, if you think about music, you know, that edge where African music met European music um, has given us gospel and rock and roll and jazz and blues and uh, hip hop and soul and so many other different musical forms um, <coughs> that have tremendously enriched our <coughs> culture um, because of that connection, because of that meaning. So, um, as one last, there's a lot of other principles, but one last one I want to talk about is what I call the principle of feed what you want to grow. <coughs> that is, <coughs> in industrial agriculture, you get a bug, a pest, that pest is the enemy. Mm. You, know, you nuke it, you pour poison on <laughs> it, you kill it, you try to get rid of it. What that does, what that always does is it creates resistance. Uh, because you never succeed in killing all those bugs. And the ones that you miss are the ones who can resist your poison, resist your toxic, and they breed. And somehow are the ones that, um, you know, the ones that you don't want always seem to outbreed the ones that you do want. <laughs> the same is true with bacteria, with antibiotics, with all those things. And I think the same is true with people. You decide certain people are terrorists, let's nuke them, let's kill them, you know, let's bomb Iraq back to the Stone Age, all of that. And what you do is you create this tremendous amount of resistance. Um, in organic agriculture, permaculture, you see a bug, you say, that bug is information. That bug is telling me something is out of balance. So how do I look at this whole system? And how do I create the conditions that are going to favor the things that I want rather than the things that I don't want? Um, maybe what I need to do rather than nuking that bug is plant some other things that are going to attract predators that are going to eat that bug. Uh, maybe instead of pouring poison on the soil and killing it, what I need to do is enrich the biological life of the soil so that our plants will be stronger and healthier and have a resistance to that bug. And a little bit of a bite from that bug may actually be helpful to our plants because they are going to help them develop what they need to resist <coughs> predation uh, and resist being taken out by that bug and other bugs. So I think that is also a principle that we can apply in our human systems. Um, in our relationships, you know, if you have something going on, <coughs> you know, we have, I live with two teenagers, and uh, the bathroom uh, <laughs> our, was, it was going to be impossible to find the sink. <laughs> there were hair products and face products and curling irons and everything. It was like, you know, you had to excavate your way to the sink. And my first response, you know, my natural instinct was, you know, I'm going to yell and scream about this and nag them until they start cleaning up. Although I knew that that actually would never work. <laughs> and I thought, all right, what would happen if I applied permaculture? What would happen if I changed the conditions in the bathroom uh, to favor the condition of the clean sink that I want? So. I took a day and I excavated the remains of, you know, leftover hair products that were clogging all the shelves that had been left by 20 years of roommates who had moved out and cleaned off the whole bathroom, threw a bunch of stuff out, 
and cleaned off two shelves and said, <coughs> you each get your shelf. Right. And anything you leave on the sink is going on your shelf. And now it's really simple. The sink stays clean because I created the right conditions. Uh, when the hair products or the curling items are left there, I just dump them on the shelf. It allows me to little moment of, you know, ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to yell, I don't have to scream, and the sink stays clean. So that's a um, perhaps silly practical example, but it works. You know? And if we were to apply that to our social relations, you know, if we look at something like the horrible tragedy in Sandy Hook, you know, and say, all right, what you know, what does that tell us? That tells us that something in our culture is deeply out of balance. Something is deeply, deeply dysfunctional. Let us look at that. Um, not how do we put more guns into every single classroom in the country, uh, which is, uh, again, you can only think of Bill Mollison's quote about evil being stupidity rigorously applied. Terms of making us, you know, I actually wrote a whole blog about you know taking dear little Jenny to kindergarten, you know, with my AK-47 to hand her over to the warm fuzzy kindergarten teacher who's armed with her at 16, you know, and don't we all feel safer now? I don't think so. <laughs> and every study has shown that the more guns you have, basically the more likely you are to have gun accidents, gun violence, gun deaths. That is not the solution. The solution is saying, what are the underlying causes of this? You know, where is our society going so crapped that people think that it's a reasonable thing to go out and uh, kill themselves by shooting masses of other people? Something is deeply wrong here. So, what do we do about this? What do we do about climate change? Um, I think we need to work on two different levels. Uh, there's the level of stopping the stupid stuff, <laughs> which we have to do. It's not the most fun way to do it, but there are things that we just have to stand up and say no to, like the continued exploitation of fossil fuels. Uh, particularly right now, the issues around the pipelines, uh, the Keystone Pipeline they're trying to put down in Texas. Um, the exploitation of the tar sands in Canada, which is the dirtiest oil on the planet, which is already pouring a billion tons of polluted water into the ecosystem every year. Uh, I spoke in that area last year and met people who live downstream from there whose friends are all dying of cancer in the indigenous communities. And um, the way the Canadian government has dealt with that has been to refuse to do epidemiological studies of food mm -hmm. use and they don't have to admit it's happening. So we see groups like the Idle No More movement which started in Canada of indigenous people standing up for their rights and standing up to protect the land um, and are tremendous inspiration. Uh, there are groups like 350.org, Bill McKibben's group that has been organizing actions around the pipelines and around uh, Keystone in particular and going to Washington and pressuring Obama, pressuring on that. And those are the kinds of things that we do desperately need to do. Another aspect of that, one of the things that I think is a very hopeful movement is the whole movement around divestment in universities and colleges. To say, all right, if we're gonna not, you know, instead of feeding what we don't want to grow, let's take our money out of fossil fuels, out of the tar sands, out of these destructive kinds of industries, and instead pressure our institutions to put it into supporting the things that we do want to create. And I think that's also a very hopeful form of action. Um, you know, there are other, a few other particularly destructive things, like fracking. Fracking. 
working with uh, hydraulic fracturing to extract natural gas, which is spreading amazing rapidity uh, around the country and to other areas. Uh, again, in a world where clean water is becoming more and more scarce, it's becoming a resource that people expect the great wars of the 21st century be fought over water. Why are we doing something that has the potential of completely polluting our water supplies for generations to come? Because I can tell you, permaculture and biology have a lot of ways to clean up toxic water. Anything that's on the surface, sooner, you know, it's not always easy, and it's a thousand times better not to pollute it in the first place. But we can bring it back to health. We can bring it back to life. But that water that's under the ground, it's almost impossible <coughs> to do that once it's polluted, once it's destroyed. So those are some really important things. <coughs> um, genetic engineering, which deeply changes the genomes of plants and which is being applied to some of our basic food plants, uh, greatest uncontrolled scientific experiment ever unleashed on the world. Um, more and more evidence all the time that these genetically engineered crops are bad for us, are causing all kinds of health problems, and are bad for the environment, are bad for the bees. Uh, those are the kinds of things we need to stand up and stop. But when we stand up to stop something, I believe our saying no is always stronger when we also know what we want to say yes to. So what are some of the solutions we should be putting into place around climate change? What would it mean if we really made that shift in consciousness and started to see the world relationally? Well, the first thing is that our shift would be an understanding that we need to shift our economy, our enterprises, our businesses from a model where they are basically in service to an abstraction that doesn't exist, mm -hmm. in service to profit, and are a given license to destroy things that really do support our life in service to that profit, to a model where, say, no businesses and enterprises are supposed to be relational. Uh, I was reading um, a book by Robert Mondavi, the wine guy, about how he started his winery. Picked it up in the thrift store, uh, looking for something soothing to read when I had it. And what was interesting was he talks about coming from an Italian family, coming from a family where business and wine growing was practiced as a set of relationships. It was in the family, um, how his father would do, never wanted to do business with someone he couldn't do business with a handshake, uh, couldn't sit and drink wine with, because it was all about people and all about relationships. And that has shifted very, very much in our culture. But we need to bring it back to an understanding that the businesses we do, that we need business. We need you know, to make things and create things and provide for our people's needs. But we need to do it. <coughs> its goal and its purpose being to provide those things we need in ways that can create lives of dignity and abundance for the people who actually do the work and that can serve the communities that they are embedded in. We need to reroute enterprises and businesses in communities and make them responsible to communities. And that means shifting our focus back to the local. How do we provide local economies that meet local needs, that serve local people, that are based on actual real human relationships? Um, because when we do that, it not only creates more abundance for more of us and distributes it more fairly, but it also means we aren't shipping all these things all over the world all the time that um, you know, we could be producing here and could be producing close by. You know, in California, we used to have a big apple um, agriculture in the county where I live. And apple growing and apple picking and 
dried apples. And all of that got plowed under because they could get apples cheaper, they could get Granny Smiths from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, it's ecologically insane to be shipping apples from New Zealand to California. <laughs> it's not even that insane to be shipping them to New England in the dead of winter, let alone California. Uh, secondly, those apples, by the time they travel, who knows what vitamins, what minerals, what real food value they have lost. And um, we no longer have that diverse kind of agriculture. The county in Santa Clara County has gone more and more and more towards monocrops of wine and grapes, um, which is another whole issue. So again, looking at some of the movements like the local food movement, um, the local economics movement, uh, say, you know, the amount of abundance of real wealth in a town is not about how much money comes into that town. It's about how many times each dollar changes hands before it leaves that town again. And so looking at the ways that we can revitalize our economies by doing things locally um, serves both that purpose of social justice and economic justice and ultimately that purpose of community resilience and um, a shift away from the problems that are causing climate change. Secondly, of course, we need alternatives in energy. Um, we need renewables. We need renewables that are put into practice in ways, uh, you know, we don't need to be running roads into pristine mountain groves to put in wind farms, we need to be finding ways to do renewables uh, in places where they can be sustainable, uh, where they can be decentralized, uh, where they can be done in ways that produce energy uh, that um, can be truly safe and that draws on that abundance of energy from the sun, from the wind, from the water, from those places that people have always drawn energy. Um, and um, we need to get away from the idea that there's going to be some big, great technological breakthrough that's going to be the answer for everything and understand that actually the answers already exist and the answers, again, are going to be relational. You know, the answer here at a place um, like Hampshire College might be really different from the answer we find in San Francisco or the answer they find in Nevada or the answer they find in Miami. But if we start looking and we start applying our human creativity, I think we are actually entering an era of energy abundance. Um, and you'll get those people, the peak oil people, who tell you, we'll never have energy abundance again. Energy scarcity. Well, that's true with fossil fuels. And fossil fuels have been this tremendously concentrated source of energy. But it's not true if we think outside the box, if we stop thinking energy has to be given to us by these giant centralized systems and start understanding that with a combination of things like conservation and efficiency uh, and alternatives and renewables and creativity, uh, we can actually live in a world where there's plenty of energy for everybody. And finally, one of the things that uh, we can say yes to that I find more, most hopeful is looking at the very ground under our feet, looking at the dirt, looking at the soil. Um, because soil is the basis of abundance. You know, there's also water and air and other things, but without soil, we have no food. Um, we live in a culture that has deeply embedded metaphors that come from that, ultimately from that spirit-nature split, that tell us everything high, light, above is good, and everything down, dark, and dirty is bad. Think about the word dirt. If I were to say, you're a piece of dirt, you probably take that as an insult. And yet, uh, 
piece of dirt is what sustains our life. Mm -hmm. Whether we lived in a world where the highest compliment you could give someone was to say, you're dirt. You mean I'm life sustaining. You mean I'm the generative source of all creativity. Um, that set of metaphors goes with the way we distribute value in our culture. Um, where people that are white have higher value than people who are dark. Where men who are associated with high and the like medicinal body have higher value than women who are associated with the body and uh, the earth. Uh, where people who are white have higher value than people who are dark. Where people who work with disembodied things, you know, who manipulate abstractions, get paid fantastic amounts of money for manipulating figures that don't actually exist mm -hmm. in the <laughs> financial markets, where people who actually work with their hands and grow food and sustain people's lives are often struggling to make a living and struggling to survive while doing that and working really hard. So shifting that set of metaphors, uh, coming back to understanding dirt and soil as the ground of life, dirt and soil uh, actually in this world have a huge carbon debt because living organic soil is full of carbon. Soil that's alive, that's fertile, it's full of organisms that are alive and fertile and those bacteria, those fungi, those things are carbon-based life forms and they're full of carbon. Uh, it's full of humus and humus is a big fat molecule packed with carbon that's kind of like a space station. It has lots of docking sites where other minerals and other things can hold on to it. So they stay in the soil and they stay in a form where plants can extract them and take them up. And humus is very stable. 